In the fall of 2020, my daughter Maya was going to attend her first year of college in Durango, Colorado. Some years prior, I made the decision that when she left for school, I would leave state as well. So after 45 years in the place I called home, I started making plans to leave Alaska with her. I originally had a Suzuki DR, but with eight years ownership, I knew it wouldn't be the bike I wanted for a long trip like this. So I sold it over the winter, and in June of last year, I bought a 2020 KTM 790 Adventure R. The only option I added from the dealership was the factory cruise control. From there, I picked up the things I needed to make it more capable for a long trip, like 35 liter panniers from Tusk, uh, 48 liter top box from Happy Trails, crash bars from Adventure Spec, uh, radiator guard, a GPS mount, a couple of soft bags to hang off the crash bars for even more storage, and finally a 10 liter waterproof tank bag from Nelson Rig. Maya would be driving her 2005 GMC Envoy with a Yakima top box. We'd planned on a mix of staying with family and friends and camping, so she left room in her rig to sleep in, and I brought a Kamek hammock tent. We left Alaska on August 1st, 2020. The day started nice enough, but within an hour we were riding in a rain that would stay with us for almost the rest of the day. Uh, we rode through Glen Allen and finally made our way to Toke, Alaska. We camped just on the other side in a little place called Toke River Campground, which is a state campground that I actually highly recommend. It is really nice. The next morning, we drove a couple hours to the border and waited for the first big test of the trip. Would I even be allowed through the country? I'd known three other people who attempted to transit Canada during the COVID lockdown, and two of them had been denied entry. I figured Maya would be fine since she had paperwork that showed her college acceptance and a move-in date for the dorms. I didn't have anything like that, but thankfully they did allow me through. However, what normally would have taken just 15 to 30 minutes ended up taking four and a half hours. We were both given a transit tag, which was a piece of paper we had to display at all times. If a police officer saw our Alaska license plates but didn't see the transit tag, we would get a ticket. We also had a warrant filled out for our arrest and immigration paperwork filled out on us. The border agent said it was the only method they had for tracking people in the country. On top of all of this, we were told we had seven days to get back out of the country and we had to use the exit we'd previously designated when we first got to the border. If we failed on either of those, they would file the warrant for our arrest and we'd be facing a $100,000 fine and up to 10 years in prison. Needless to say, we were quite motivated to ensure we met both those requirements. In spite of the delay at the border, we pushed past Whitehorse and camped off the road somewhere near Little Teslin Lake. I think we ended up traveling about 450 miles or 750 kilometers that second day. Due to the regulations limiting our time in country, the original plan of seven days to get through Canada was pretty quickly tossed out. 
The only detour we allowed ourselves was to stop at Watson Lake to visit an attraction called the Signpost Forest. This was started by a homesick GI in 1942 when he erected a signpost for his hometown of Danville, Illinois, some 2,835 miles away. Now, 60 years later, there are over 80,000 signs posted and include everything from a toilet seat with names written in Sharpie to custom wood signs made just to be hung there. From Watson Lake, we had to backtrack a bit on Highway 1 until we could turn back south onto Highway 37 and enter British Columbia. Over the next nine hours or so, I think we saw 11 black bears, three fox, and one porcupine. This would also be the longest day of the trip through Canada, adding about a thousand kilometers or about 620 miles to the odometer. We woke the next morning and agreed we should probably try to find a camping spot when it wasn't already dark. So the third day we did just 460 miles or 740 kilometers and ended up camping at a random pull off on the side of the road just outside of Williams Lake. The last leg of the trip was back on Highway 1 until we turned off to go to the Abbotsford border crossing. We had to stop at the Canadian border crossing, which was odd since there's no parking on the exiting side of the building. Um, we ended up bringing all of the paperwork inside that we were given at the Alaska border crossing, including the transit tag. 
And while in there, they canceled the warrant and the immigration paperwork. And then they actually walked us out to our vehicles and watched to make sure we drove the 30 yards or so to the American crossing. And after a few questions from the U.S. border agent, we were waved through and the end of the first leg of the trip was in sight. This first bit of the trip from Anchorage, Alaska to Bellingham, Washington had taken us five days. We traveled 2,180 miles or about 3,510 kilometers. And because of the aggressive schedule through Canada, we would end up staying in Bellingham for five days, just kind of resting and enjoying time spent with the family, and then preparing for the second lake. 